So I want to talk to you today about trusting the source of life with the stuff of life. About trusting God, not, not only for the things that we need in life, but also with the things we need, because those two ideas are really, really closely linked together. Uh, if you want to follow along, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 17 today. Really encourage you to follow along in your own Bible. Also encourage you to use the Missionals app. You'll find some uh, message notes there and some place to take some own notes that you can continue to think about and process later. Uh, but we're in a series here at Mission Hills called When the River Runs Dry. It's a series based on the life of the prophet Elijah. Last week, we, we saw that God told Elijah to go to King Ahab and deliver a message. King Ahab was the king of the Jewish people. He was the king of God's people. But he had disobeyed God, and he'd married a Canaanite woman named Jezebel. And just like God warned, uh, this Canaanite woman, Jezebel, had actually led Ahab to stop worshiping the true God and start worshiping one of her false gods named Baal. Now, Baal was the, supposed to be the lord of the the dew and the rain. And so God sent Elijah to say to Ahab, hey, the real, do, uh, the real Lord of the dew and the rain says there's not going to be any more dew and rain until I say so, just so you stop being confused about the source of your supply. And uh, that, that did not make Elijah like a super popular guy. It actually kind of made him public enemy number one. Ahab and Jezebel started trying to kill him. And so God sent him to the Kareth Ravine to hide. And while he was hiding there, God provided for him. He miraculously sent ravens that brought uh, bread and meat to him. And he drank from the river that was running through the ravine. But then uh, as we pick up the story today, 1 Kings 17, 7, sometime later the brook dried up because there had not been rain in the land. And then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. This is the river ran dry, and that, that didn't mean that God had stopped paying attention to Elijah. It didn't mean that he turned his back on him. He still had a, another way to provide for him. But to, to take a hold of that provision, Elijah was going to have to trust God. And, and I think it really that's ultimately why God allowed that first river to run dry in, in, at all, because the reality is... And I've seen this time and time again in my life. Some of you have seen this the same thing. A dry riverbed makes a great path to its source. A dry riverbed provides a great path to walk as we, as we go in search of the source of that river. I need, I need to tell you something super embarrassing. Um, this weekend, Coletta and I watched Top Gun for the first time. What? I know. Now, I, 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 can't, I can't throw my wife under the bus. My wife had seen it before. Yeah, my wife had seen it. It was first time for me. First time. For, I'm getting wows. and like, yeah. Like, we thought we respected you, but now we're not so sure, right? Yeah, let, let me tell you why I hadn't watched it before. See, it came out about just really not long after a, a, I was dealing with a dry riverbed in my life. So I grew up in an Air Force family. We grew up on uh, military bases, and I was always watching F-15 fighter jets do their exercises, and I, like, that's what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to fly F-15 fighters. And uh, a couple years before Top Gun came out, I, I went to class one day, and they're like, oh, we're doing a different kind of test today. We're, we're doing this little eye test. You stick your head in this thing, and you're supposed to tell us, where, where's the apple? And apparently I got that one wrong. Because they, they were like, well, they, we want you to look at this, this, uh, this thing on the wall, and we want you to tell us you know, what, what, what the letters are. And I was like, those are hieroglyphics. Those are not letters. What's this sneakiness you're doing here? And they're like, oh, you, you need glasses or contacts. And that was, that was devastating because I realized in that moment I was not going to be flying F-15 fighter jets. And that, that was, that, I mean, that was like, uh, that was hard. That's what I wanted to do when I grew up. That's what my whole life had kind of been sort of aiming towards. And when that happened to me and that river ran dry and then the Top Gun movie came out, I was, just, I was still struggling. But, but I can tell you now after the fact that honestly one of, the, one of the greatest gifts God has ever given me is bad eyes. <laughs> because that, that dry river, riverbed became a path that I walked when I was searching for the source and, and it led me ultimately to, to dig deeper into who God was and what God was, was calling me to do in my life. And I've, I've been able to be part of so many things that I would have missed out on if I'd gone down that particular road. But instead, I, I walked up a dry riverbed and I found the source of all rivers. And I'm so grateful for that. And that's what Elijah is kind of facing right now. He's got a dry riverbed, but a dry riverbed's a great path to walk in the search for the source. And so God's basically saying, I want you to trust me. And so he says, he says get up. And go at once to this other place. And it's interesting, in the original Hebrew, what, what he literally says is, get up. It's translated as go at once because there's a sense of urgency to it. 
God, God is saying, hey, you can't stay where you are. You've got to get up and go. And, and I think the reason that, that God gives that particular command is because Elijah is not that much different than the rest of us. And, and when we have a place of provision, our temptation is always to want to try to stay in that place, Right? Maybe tomorrow the river will start flowing again. Maybe just a little bit longer and everything that I I used to get from this place, I'm going to get again. And and I think Elijah's temptation to want to stay in that place is probably two things. Number one, it's just been, like I said, it's just been a place since we think maybe it could be again. But, But also it's probably because what God is asking him to do here is terrifying. It's terrifying. Why do I say that? Well, God says, I I want you to go to this place called Sidon, to the region of Sidon. Here's what you need to know about Sidon. Sidon was Canaanite territory. So it was was enemy territory. It was the the territory of the tribes that surrounded Israel. It wasn't Israelite home turf. It was enemy territory. And just to make it a little bit worse, Sidon was where Jezebel was from. It was Jezebel's hometown. And and remember, Elijah is just the one who has denounced Jezebel's God and and essentially denounced Jezebel. He's basically said, yeah, this woman who's brought this false God to Israel, she's a liar. And now God's like, yeah, why don't you go hang out in her hometown? It's like, yeah, that's not smart, God. I I was trying to find some way to like put that in modern terms. And here's the only way I can think of it. It'd be kind of like if the Pope went on national news and said, yeah, just so everybody knows, Allah isn't real and Muhammad is a liar. And then he tried to go to Mecca. You'd be like, that, that's not a good place to go. This doesn't make sense. That's what essentially what, what God has asked Elijah to do. It's a terrifying thing. And, and Elijah, of course, has got some questions. He's like, yeah, okay, yeah, you're telling me that there's a widow there that's going to supply my needs. Yeah, I, I don't understand how that's going to work. Because first off, she's a Canaanite, so she's not going to be willing to help me out. And second, she's a widow. Widows are the poorest of the poor in the best of conditions. In the midst of a drought and a famine, she, she, she couldn't provide for me even if she was willing to. Even if she was willing, she's not going to be able. So how is that going to work? He had questions about that. But what God's asking him to do is to focus on who, not how. Okay. He's saying, I-, I want you to trust me. Don't worry about how I'm going to take care of you. I'm giving you just enough to know that I've got a plan. But I want you to focus on who, not how. Because, and this is so important, church, listen to me. Because if God is the source of life, he can be trusted to take care of the stuff of life. Right? If God really is the source of life that we think he is, then he can be trusted to take care of all the stuff of life that we need. Absolutely he can. But but that's hard, right? It's a hard thing to to get a handle on. Because the stuff of life, the stuff that's right in front of us, that tends to be the stuff that kind of attracts our trust, right? And so God's saying, hey, listen, I I want you to focus on who, not how. Trust that the source of life can take care of the stuff. Take your eyes off of the stuff that's been right in front of you. Look up the dry riverbed to the ultimate source of all the rivers. By the way, it's interesting. I mean, this is basically what Jesus said. Jesus said, you know, we, people, spend so, people spend so much time, they're all worried about what they're going to wear and what they're going to eat and drink and where they're going to live. But he said, seek first the kingdom of God and the king who's in the kingdom, the king who makes it a kingdom. And he says, all these other things will be added to you. You, you trust the source of life, and because he is the source of life, he will take care of the stuff of life. And so, so God says, I need you to trust who, don't worry so much about how. Okay, so that's, that's what Elijah needs to do. Now, so how does he do that? How does he, how does he demonstrate that trust? Does he just declare it? Do you just go, okay, God, I, I definitely trust you and say where he is? No. What does he got to do? He's got to go. He's got to get up and go. That's what God told him to do. Get up and go at once. Because here's the reality. But by, by going, even though he doesn't understand how, he, he's saying, but I know enough about who, Right? Listen, this is an important principle. We demonstrate our trust in God by putting obedience before understanding. You with me? It's one of the clearest ways we demonstrate our faith in God. It's, because we, it's, by, it's by putting obedience before understanding. Now listen, I'm not talking about trusting a God who's never given you any reason to trust Him. Okay? I'm not talking about a blind leap into the dark here. The, the, the issue here basically is we, we trust the God who has provided, will provide, even though we don't understand how. But we're trusting a God who's shown us over and over again that he can be trusted. That's what the cross is, right? 
It's a trust that God loves you so much he would send his own son to pay the price for the sin that separates us from him. It's what the empty tomb is. It's the proof that God has accomplished what none of our effort ever could. The barrier between us and God is removed. This is a God who has provided over and over again. And so the God who has provided, we're going to trust he will provide, even though we don't necessarily understand how. But I tell you what, I remember when, when we began to understand that God was calling us to Mission Hills, there was a whole lot of questions Colette and I had. There's a lot we didn't understand because, I mean, I'd only been a lead pastor at that point for about a year. And I'd all been in a much smaller church. I'd never been on staff in a larger church. And so understanding how is it that I'm going to be able to lead effectively in a church that size, like there was all kinds of how questions. But we began to understand God was saying, don't worry about how, you worry about who. Do you trust me? And we're so glad that we, we put obedience over understanding. That's what Elijah's being called to do. And maybe in some way you're being called to do exactly that same thing right now. It's what Elijah's being called to do, and, and, and it's what he did. And so he went. He went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her, and he asked, w would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I could have a drink? And what he's doing is he, he's testing her willingness. He doesn't really expect her to be willing. He expects her to go, um, you're an Israelite man, and I'm a Canaanite woman. Why don't you go get it for yourself, dude? That's really what he expects to happen. But to his surprise, she actually is willing. And she actually turns and says, yeah, I'll, I'll go to the well. I'll get you a little bit of water. And so she heads off. And as she was going to get it, he called out, oh, oh, and bring me a piece of bread, please. Bring me a piece of bread. Now he's testing her ability. See, he wasn't testing her ability with the water because the water would have come from a well, and even though they're in a drought, the, the wells would have been fed by, by deep aquifers, and so even in the midst of a drought, there, there probably would have been water in the well as long as it was deep enough. So there he's really testing, are you willing to go get it? But now he's testing her ability because, again, she, she's a widow, and it's the middle of a drought and a famine, and so because the widows were the poorest of the poor, she, she probably didn't have enough food for herself, and it's almost inconceivable that she would have had enough to share with a stranger. So now he knows that she would, but, but he wants to know if she could. And so he calls out, would, would you also bring me a piece of bread? And she's on her way, and she suddenly stops. And she turns back around, and she probably sighs, and her shoulders are slumped, and her head's a little low. And she says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. She says, I don't have any. I, I would if I could, but I, I, I can't. And, and she anticipates that he, he might think maybe she was holding out on him, right? And so she swears a solemn oath. That's, that's what this, as surely as the Lord your God lives, is. That was an oath. It was a solemn oath. She was saying, I'm swearing on the name of the Lord, on the, the, the existence of the Lord your God, that I don't have any bread. But you know what's really interesting? Do you notice? You know what's really interesting about that oath? She swears on his God, not hers. She says, I, I swear on the name of the Lord your God, as surely as the Lord your God lives. That's really interesting. By, by the way, a little piece of trivia that's actually not so trivial here. Um, whenever you come across the word Lord in the Bible, and it's all caps, What's that telling you is the Hebrew word underneath there is actually Yahweh. Yahweh was the Hebrew personal name for God. The, the Jewish people tried not to say it out loud too much so that it didn't become kind of trivial. And so whenever they came across the word Yahweh in the Bible, they actually said the word Lord instead. And, and over the years, English translations have kind of followed that tradition. But, but she actually says, as surely as Yahweh, your God, lives. She names him particularly. But that's really interesting. She says, as surely as Yahweh lives, not as surely as Baal lives. Why would she swear by his God? And I think the answer is because at this point, she's starting to question whether or not Baal is really all he's cracked up to be. Normally I'd swear by Baal, but honestly, Baal hasn't done much lately. And I'm not sure I want to swear by him living because I'm not quite sure he does. In, in other words, this is so important. She, she's beginning to have some doubts. She had some doubts about whether or not her God had the goods. Do you hear me? She's questioning whether or not her God really had the goods. Now, he, he, she's not saying Elijah's God or her God. She still makes it very clear. You know, surely as the Lord, your God lives. He's your God, not mine. But she's got real questions about her God. 
He's not sure that he's got the goods. But she hasn't really shifted yet. She hasn't transferred her trust. Because she's not all that different than you are. She's not that different than I am. And the reality is that we all have gods, little g-gods, that we tend to turn to, even though they've consistently failed to provide what they promised. Right? We we look to relationships. Well, that's where I'm going to go. My needs met. We have a community of people. They're the ones who are going to give me my identity, my security, right? We, we, ha- we have a job. We have a career. We, we have money that comes in. We have possessions we own. And we, we look at those things, even though they've consistently failed to provide what we need. But we keep looking to them. And I think there's some people that are listening to this message today because God wants you to hear this. You've got a a God that doesn't have the goods. You hear me? You you keep turning to a God who just doesn't have the goods. He doesn't have what you're looking for. In fact, I, I want you to deal with this question. What God are you tempted to turn to even when it fails to deliver the goods it promised? Because we all have those. There are hiding places in our lives. And that's where she is. She's got questions about her God, but she hasn't transferred her trust from him yet either. She says, I don't have any flour. I don't have any bread. I have just a tiny little bit of flour, a little tiny bit of olive oil in a jug. And she says, I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. I would if I could, but I can't. I've got just enough to pour that little bit of olive oil and that little bit of flour. I'm going to make a bite or two that my son and I are going to eat, and that's going to be our last meal. This is it. We're we're done. And this is rock bottom, right? She's at rock bottom. And some of you know what it's like to be at rock bottom. Some of you are there right now. I'm not there at the moment, but, I, but I've been there. I know what it feels like to be in that place, and it's, it's not good. It's a desperate, dark place. But, but I need to speak a truth into your life today about rock bottom. Rock bottom will teach you truths mountaintops can't. Rock bottom will teach you things that, that no mountaintop is capable of teaching you. And, and, and it may very well be that the most important of those truths is is this. I I love the way Tony Evans described rock bottoms. He said, sometimes God lets you hit rock bottom so you'll discover he is the rock at the bottom. I look back on my life and every one of the most important truths that I've come to understand about who God is and, and how much he loves me and what it looks like to follow Jesus, the greatest truths I've discovered at the lowest points in my life. And that's where this woman is. She's at rock bottom, and she's been told her entire life, Baal is the rock you can stand on. Baal is your refuge. And now she's down at the bottom, and she's looking around. She's realizing the rock is just a bunch of dried mud. But there's another rock. There's another rock she could put her feet on. And so Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and and do as you have said, but first... Make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day that the Lord sends the rain, until Yahweh sends the rain. He says, yeah, I know that, uh, that your God failed to deliver the goods. I know that Baal turned out not to be the rock you were looking for, but there is another rock And he's the source of all the stuff that Baal can't give you. And on the one hand, what he's saying here is it's a a promise, right? He's promising what his God is going to do. But at the same time, I think it's so important we recognize this, it's also an invitation. He's giving her an invitation. What he's basically saying is, listen, my God can be your God, and my God can do what yours never could. Will you trust Yahweh? Will you trust Yahweh? My God, will you let my God become your God? Okay, how does she do that? How does she transition her trust? How does she transfer? How does she make that 
that, that move? Does she just sit there and go, okay, yeah, I trust your God? No. It takes just one little thing more than that. Remember how Elijah couldn't stay where he was? He had to get up and go. He had to put obedience ahead of understanding. Well, he's asking her to do the same thing here. You notice what he said to do? He said, here's what I want you to do. First, I know you're going home, you're trying to make that last meal for your son, but first I want you to actually make some of that bread you were going to make and I want you to bring it to me. Do that first, he says. Now, I don't know about you, but like my first reaction to that is, dude, cold, right? Like how selfish can you be? She just said we're going to eat our last couple of bites and, and he's like, yeah, could I have one of those first? Like, it seems like a strange thing to do, but, but what we need to understand, it was easier in the ancient world for them to understand, I think a little harder for us in the modern world. Elijah was a prophet. As a prophet, he represented God, and so by asking her to bring him bread, he was basically saying, hey, w- w- would you trust God with a little bit of that bread first? And what he's asking her to do is to follow a principle that we find all over Scripture, and that is that, that you take hold of the promise of God by faith, Right? The Bible says it over and over again, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. Okay, but what does faith look like? Just declaring? No, no, it looks like demonstrating. So so what is she supposed to do to demonstrate this faith that allows her to take hold of all these promises? He says, bring me the bread first. Because here, here's, here's the thing. We demonstrate our faith in the source of life by trusting him first with some of the stuff of life. You hear me? That's how we demonstrate faith. We trust the source of life by by giving him first, trusting him first with some of the stuff of life. You see the principle all over the Bible. It's the first fruits principle. It's the reason why the the Jewish people, when they took in a harvest, they took the first 10%, the first tithe, and they did what? They they brought it to the storehouses of the temple. They gave it to God. It's why whenever they brought in money, they gave the first 10%. To God. It's why some of them, even when they had their first child, they dedicated that child to God. Because what they were doing by giving God a little bit of that stuff first, they were saying, this stuff isn't my rock. This stuff isn't my refuge. This stuff isn't where my hope is. It's in the source, not the stuff. We give it, we give it to God after the fact, after we've used up what we need. What we're really saying is, this stuff is actually where my trust is, Right? You know, well, well, yeah, I got some money came in, and I did what I need to do. I paid my bills, and then I did this, and I did this, and, and there's a little bit left over. And say, so, yeah, I'm going to give that. Okay, what you've really said is, that's where my trust is. And so this principle is that we, we demonstrate our, our trust in the source of life by giving him first some of the stuff of life. It's why we say here at Mission Hills that giving first honors God. Giving first honors God. Giving first honors God, saving second practices wisdom, and then living on the rest builds contentment. But that whole process there, giving first, saving second, living on the rest, all that's really doing is it's saying, my trust isn't in the stuff, it's in the source. And I'm sure she's got questions. She doesn't understand this. But he says, if you want to put your trust in God, obedience has to come before understanding. And so she went away. And she did as Elijah had told her. And there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman or family. And I think the implication of that is every day she brought him some of the food first. And every day there was enough for Elijah, but there was also enough for, for she and her son For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Man, I wish I could have seen that, don't you? I mean, I I, I try to picture it from the perspective of her son, where she goes home, and she's like, okay, we're going to take the last little bit of flour, the last bit of oil, we're going to mix up a little dough, we're going to make bread. He's like, oh, I'm so hungry. And she's like, okay, hang on a second. I'm going to take this to this dude out here. He's like, oh, what what guy? Like, is, is that one of our priests? Not exactly. He's the one who basically said our priests are wasting their time because our God isn't real. You're taking him our last bit of bread. Yeah. And she does. And she comes back and he's like, what do we do now? And she's like, I, I don't know. I mean, I... Huh.
<laughs> and she, she, she makes bread, and, and every day the process repeats over and over and over again, right? I mean, because of her great step of faith, and it was a huge step of faith for her, right? Because of her great step of faith, she has a great supply of food, which is, it, it's, it's a really beautiful picture of something that we find God say in the book of Malachi, Malachi 3.10. He said to his people, bring the whole tithe, the whole first 10% into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. It's a beautiful picture of that. Now, I'm always a little nervous when I when I read a passage like that, yeah, it's the word of God, but I also know sometimes it can get twisted into something it's never intended to be. And so I, I want to tell you something important. I said this last week, but I'm going to say it again. God's not a vending machine, okay? He's not a vending machine, but he's not a slot machine either. He's not a vending machine, meaning it's not give God your first 10%, press these buttons, and you'll get back this particular result every time. No, 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 that's not the promise. But he's also not a slot machine where you, you follow the principles and the patterns we find in Scripture. And you're like, I have no idea if there's ever going to be a payoff or not. No, no, no. You follow the principles and patterns in Scripture, there's always going to be a payoff. God's always going to bless. He might bless in a different way. He might bless in different, you know, through different means as well as different kinds of supplies. But he will always take care of you. And that's what we see happening here. And I really, really wish that was the end of this story. But it's not. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse, and he finally stopped breathing. And she said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did, did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? And like, who can blame her, right? I mean, she just lost her, her only son. Of course, she's, she's devastated. Of course, she's frustrated. Of course, she's angry. Of course, she's confused. Of course, she's bitter. Of course, she is. But there's another thing going on here that, that would be easy to miss because we live in a different world than she lived in. In the world that she lived in, what we need to understand is this, this boy wasn't just her son. He was also the stuff of life. Because they didn't have Medicare, they, they didn't have Social Security, they didn't have food banks. For, for this woman, th this boy was the one who was going to give her what she needed. He was going to feed her when she got old. He was going to make sure she had clothes when she got old. He was going to make sure she had a place to live when she got old. He wasn't just her son, he was the stuff of life. But now he's dead. And she's not just grieving, she's lost a son, she's panicking. She's like, what am I going to do? And her reaction is actually a revelation. Her, her, her reaction actually reveals a lot about where her trust is, because listen to me, how we react to the loss of the stuff of life tells us a lot about our trust in the source of life. How we react when we lose some of the stuff of life tells us a lot about how much trust we actually had in that. I, I want you to do something right now. I want you to think about a time that you've lost some stuff. Maybe it was a relationship, maybe it was a community, maybe it was a house, maybe it was a job, maybe it was a possession, maybe it was an ability, maybe it was money. Maybe you've been watching the stock market over the last couple of weeks, and you're feeling it. You're feeling the loss of some, some stuff of life, and, and what I need you to understand is that your reaction is a revelation. It tells you something very important. It tells me something very important, and so let me ask you the question, what does your reaction to loss tell you about where your trust is? Let, let God work in you in that question. It's an important question. Her trust was in this child. She's standing in front of Elijah and she's saying, what now? Where's your God now? Give me your son, Elijah replied. Give me your son. She's standing there with this dead child in her arms. She's grieving and she's panicking. And he reaches out his arms and he says, give him to me. 
Now, I remember when my, when my daughters were born, and by the grace of God, they, they, they were healthy, and then medical people came, and they're like, you know, give us your daughter, we're going to take, take them away, and we're going to test them and poke them and prod them. And I was like, no. That was a really hard thing to do with, with living, breathing, healthy children in my arms. I can't even imagine how difficult this request is of this woman who's clutching this dead child to her chest. And Elijah says, give him to me. But you understand what he's doing is the same thing he did with the bread. He's saying, demonstrate your trust in the source of life by giving him first the stuff of life. And he took him from her. He took him from her arms. And he carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and he laid him on his bed. And then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? And it kind of sounds like Elijah's struggling a little bit with God, right? And I, I love that. I'm so glad that Elijah is struggling with God because here's the thing. I struggle with God sometimes. Can I tell you that as a pastor? Sometimes I struggle with God, especially when the river runs dry. I struggle with God. How many of us, all of our campuses, online, everywhere, how many of us struggle with God sometimes? Yeah, absolutely we do. Here's the good news. If even the great prophet Elijah sometimes struggles with God, then that means there's a word for you and me. You know what the word is? Normal. We're normal. Because here's the thing. Listen, faith doesn't mean we never struggle. It means we keep choosing to take the next step of trust. Faith doesn't mean we never struggle. It doesn't mean we never question. It doesn't, never means we don't get angry. Faith means we keep choosing, even in the midst of that struggle, to take the next step of trust, the next step up the dry riverbed towards the source. So then he stretched himself out over the boy three times, three times, and he cried out, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. He did it three times. There's nothing magical about the number three. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says, when you pray something, pray it three times. What that means is Elijah laid himself on that board. And he said, God, restore this boy's life, and nothing happened. So what did he do? He took another step up the dry riverbed. And he said, God, restore this boy's life, and nothing happened. So he took another step. Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. And the Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. And Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house, and he gave him to his mother, and he said, Look, your son is alive. Probably important at this point to let you know something about Baal. Baal. Baal was the Lord of the dew and the rain, but those were just symbols. Those were symbols of life. See, the Canaanite belief was that Baal was the Lord of life. And now Elijah has just made it very, very clear that that was a lie. There's only one Lord of life, and his name is not Baal. So she hands a living boy back to his mother. And then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. And I don't know if you caught it. It's, it's, it's a subtle, but it's a really significant shift. It's no longer your God. It's just the God. It's the Lord. It's Yahweh. She's transferred her trust, which was the point all along. And, and yeah, it was a little bit of a hard road to get there, but sometimes we got to hit rock bottom to find that God is the rock at the bottom, right? See, the reality is that every dry river is actually an invitation to take our next step towards the source. You hear me, church? 
You're facing dry rivers in your life right now. You face them in the past. They may come in the future, but you need to understand that every dry river is an invitation to take your next step towards the source. And so the question is just, what's your next step towards the source? See, I I have a retirement account. Um, That's cool to say. I didn't used to be able to say that. I've only had one for a few years now, actually, since I came to Mission Hills, and it, it's heavily invested in stocks, and so, like, my retirement account is a little scary right now. Now, my wife and I practice something called spirit-led generosity, and what we mean by that is we, we, get to, we take the first 10% of, of everything that comes in, and we give that to our church, to Mission Hills. We're trusting God, the source of life, with the first little bit of our stuff of life, right? That's, that's our plan. But above and beyond that, we also, we, we look for ways to, to honor God but by giving of our resources to other kingdom advancing work. And it, it, about this time of year, you know, we usually get more mail than we usually get because as a pastor, uh, right about this time, I, our mailbox gets flooded with, with letters and they basically start by, hey, Craig and Coletta, I'm going on a mission trip. And then at the end, you know, would you like to give 50 or 100 or 150 or maybe you'd like to give 500? And and we get a lot of those. And, and, and most summers, like, we're like, yeah, we're going to give our 10% of church. We're not changing that. And, but, yeah, we're going to lean in, and we give a lot of money to help people do those kinds of things. And, and I, during this sort of financial downturn right now, I have never once thought about giving less to Mission Hills. I've never once thought about changing that 10%, changing that recurring giving. No, 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 I'm not touching that. But I will be honest with you and tell you that I have been thinking, maybe we shouldn't be giving quite so much missions trip support this year. And then I studied this passage and was like, fine, Jesus, I get it. <laughs> and so we, we, we're giving as generously there as, as we can. Much more than I'm inclined to do because I, I get it. I know what it's like just to struggle. But I also know that, that, that we demonstrate our trust in the source of life by, by giving, by trusting Him with, which is really trusting Him for, stuff of life. And I know that every dry river is an invitation to take that next step. So what's your next step? For some of you, maybe like me, maybe it's just continuing to take the steps you're already taking of living generously. Maybe, it, maybe it's time to step that up. It's a little counterintuitive. I know that. But maybe look for ways to live more generously than you ever have before. And maybe for some of you, honestly, the, the next step that God's speaking to you is, is the first step of, of trusting Jesus at all. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't, I don't have a relationship with that God I can trust. But He wants to be your God. He wants that relationship. He wants to provide for you. It's, it's interesting to me how, how, how much this story parallels an event from the life of Jesus where Jesus was in enemy territory. He was in a Samaritan village and He was talking to a, a Samaritan woman. And he said, hey, would you, would you put down the, the cup into the well and give me something to drink? And she's like, you're an Israelite man. You're talking to a Samaritan woman. What's your deal? It's a rough translation of the Greek, trust me. (laughs) And he said, if you you knew who who was asking you, you would have asked me, actually, and I would have given you living water. You drink that water, you're going to get thirsty again, but you drink the water I give you, and and it's it's a spring that wells up to eternal life, and you're never going to thirst again. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus... He wants to do that for you. Your, your, your first step is the first step into a relationship with someone who will provide all that you need, not necessarily in the ways that you're expecting, but He will take care of you. But you've got to take that next step, whether it's your first or your 500th, towards the source. Would you pray with me? God, as those of us who count ourselves followers of Jesus. We, we, we thank you for this word, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would convict us of those places. We got little G gods hiding out in our lives. Reveal them to us, Lord, so that we can turn away from them. They don't have the goods. Show us what our next step of trust is, whether it's living generously or in some other way, Lord, taking that next step of trust towards you. And for those that are here today and, and they know that their next step is their first step, if that's you, here, here's how you do it. Here's how you come up the dry riverbed to find that Jesus is waiting to supply all your needs. You just have a conversation with him. It goes like this. God, I've sinned and I'm sorry. I've done wrong. I'm sorry. 
Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. And I'm ready to trust you. Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you. I'm choosing to follow you from here on out. I receive forgiveness and eternal life. And I trust you for the stuff of life. Amen. Can we celebrate those who have made that decision for the first time today? Hey, listen, if you made that decision for the first time today, I'm going to ask you to do something to kind of like plant your flag in the ground, demonstrate that faith. Uh, Very simple. Just let us know you made the decision. If you're watching online, you can click the button that's right around me. You'll see it. Um, If you're on one of our campuses or you're somewhere else listening to this message, you you can always just text the word Jesus to 80875. Text the word Jesus to 80875. You're just going to let us know you made that decision. We're going to celebrate that with you, send you some free resources to help you begin living it out. We worship a God that can be trusted. Amen? Amen. Amen.